everyone's ready, um, we can get started. So um, welcome everyone uh, to the uh, to this week's uh, One World Combinatorics on Words seminar. Our speaker today is Eric Rowland from Hofstra University. And um, he's going to speak to us about algebraic power series and their automatic complexity. Yeah, thanks, Narad. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Manon Stipulanti and Reem Yasawi. And uh, the, the motivation for this whole topic really came from some papers about 15 years ago that started looking at integer sequences that arise in combinatorics uh, that count various objects and reducing them modulo primes and modulo prime powers, uh, sort of taking a number theoretic approach to these integer sequences. Um, so for example, the Catalan numbers uh, count many, many objects in combinatorics. For example, they count the plane trees with n leaves. Uh, so for example, these are the plane trees with, uh, sorry, n edges. These are the plane trees with four edges. Um, and there are 14 of them. This is the fourth Catalan number, 14. And uh, so what you could do and what people started doing was reducing these Catalan numbers and other sequences modulo two, and you get this sequence. And uh, this sequence turns out to be fairly easy to describe. The nth number, the nth Catalan number is odd, leaving you with a one mod two, if and only if n plus one is a power of two. Uh, and so this particular result follows from, you know, there's this, re there's this representation of the nth Catalan number in terms of a binomial coefficient, it's 2n choose n divided by n plus 1. And a uh, result of Coomer tells you the highest power of p that divides a certain binomial coefficient. So just, you can get this pretty easily from that. Um, but what if we look at the Catalan numbers mod 4? So we get this more complicated sequence. Uh, this is in a, a result from a paper in 2008 that says that the value of the Catalan numbers modulo 4 basically has to do with whether you can write n plus one as a power of two or a sum of two powers of two uh, or not. And so we already see some, some base two representation coming in, even though it's not really explicit in this theorem. Um, the same authors also gave this description for the nth Catalan number modulo eight. Uh, and again, it's more you know powers of two. Um, a few years later, there's another paper that gives this piecewise uh, formula for the nth Catalan number modulo 16. Uh, and now, so now you have all these uh, case, crazy cases and these complicated formulas or complicated uh, functions involving, basically they're involving the base two representation of N. Um, it's not worthwhile to go into what all these things are. There's an even more complicated formula in the same paper for the nth Catalan number modulo 64. Um, and uh, and this is kind of where we came in. We, th we thought, well, there's a better way to to represent all of these formulas rather than piecewise functions in various constructor functions that happened that uh, extract certain information from the base two representation of n, uh, and that's to represent them by automatic sequences. So, what is an automatic sequence? Uh, a sequence is p automatic if there is an automaton that outputs the nth term of the sequence when you feed in the base p representation of n. And in this talk, we will be feeding base p representations starting with the least significant digits. So for example, this is an automaton that computes the nth number, the nth Catalan number modulo four. Um, if you wanted to know what the ninth Catalan number modulo four is, what you would do is you would write nine in base two. And uh, since we're reading least significant digit first, you would start with this one right here. You would read one, zero, zero, one. So let's go through the automaton here. So this is the initial state here. We would read a one and then a zero and then another zero and then finally a one. We would finish in this state, and the output corresponding to this state is two. So the ninth Catalan number modulo two, uh, modulo four is two, and uh, and this sequence is a two automatic sequence. 
um, because you can get the, in general, you can get the nth term of the sequence by feeding the base two representation of n into this automaton. Uh, so here are automata for the Catalan numbers modulo eight and modulo 16, and Catalan numbers uh, modulo 32 and modulo 64. So these are sort of alternative answers to the question, what is the nth Catalan number modulo 64? Here's an automaton that you can use to evaluate it. And the nice thing about automata and automatic sequences more generally is that uh, they have light, not lots of nice computable properties. Uh, you can determine whether a sequence is uh, eventually periodic, for example, you can determine whether there are any missing residues. So on the on the previous slide, uh, let's go back here. Um, for example, no Catalan number is congruent to three mod four. And uh, and here they also show that no Catalan number is congruent to seven mod eight. And so these things can be read off directly from the automata because you just, you, you just check all the states and you see that there's no state that outputs a, a three or a seven. So it turns out that this doesn't just work for powers of two. If you're looking at any prime power and you reduce the Catalan numbers modulo p to the alpha, you get a p automatic sequence for every alpha greater than or equal to one. So why is this true? Um, this is even this is true more generally for algebraic sequences, meaning that uh, if you consider the generating series. Um, of the sequence by putting the nth coefficient in the nth term of the sequence in front of x to the n and summing them all up, then the, the series satisfies a polynomial equation. So this is uh, the polynomial equation satisfied by the generating series of the Catalan numbers, except that we've we started at n equals one here. This is just a minor technical point. Um, since c of zero is one and not zero, uh, to apply this next step, we we just truncate it, uh, take off that first term. Uh, you can always put it back on later, so it's not uh, we don't lose any any expressive power. Um, so we have this polynomial that represents the Catalan numbers through its generating series, uh, and Furstenberg showed us how to convert an algebraic power series into the diagonal of a rational series. So if we take this polynomial, we replace this f with a, with a y. So this is a bivariate polynomial in x and y. Uh, this rational expression right here um, will give us a, a bivariate rational series. And if we take its diagonal, then we will recover the, the sequence of Catalan numbers, the series for it. Um, you can expand this into a bivariate series because the denominator has a constant term that is non-zero. So we can expand this using, you know, polynomial division or or geometric series expansion if you if you wanted to. So so we've converted an algebraic series to the diagonal of a rational function, and then the final ingredient is this theorem from Deneff and Lipschitz in 1987 that says any diagonal of a rational function. Uh, if you reduce it modulo p to the alpha, you get a p automatic sequence. Uh, and this is stated more generally for p adic integers, but um, if you want to just think of it as um, diagonals of rational functions where the, the coefficients of the numerator and denominator are integers, that's that's perfectly fine too. Uh, the only condition is that we need the denominator. We need to be able to actually compute it. You know, it, it needs to represent a series. So. Um, uh, if we want integer coefficients, we need the uh, integer coefficients of mod p or mod p to the alpha. We need the constant term of the denominator to be invertible modulo p. So anytime you have an algebraic uh, sequence, and a lot of combinatorial sequences in, in, comb in combinatorics are algebraic, you can run this procedure, uh, remove the first term if necessary, it's not zero. You get a polynomial expression for the generating series. You can turn that into the diagonal of a rational function. And this theorem of Deneff and Lipschitz tells you that that sequence is automatic. And it gives you a construction, actually, for an automaton that builds the nth term modulo uh, p to the alpha. So what we're interested in in this talk is how big are the automata that you get? So for the Catalan numbers, modulo powers of two, um, where alpha goes from one to nine, here is the size of the automaton and the, that's measured in the number of states. So this is the number of states in the automaton that you get 
in this construction. Um, you could always minimize the automaton. So here we have we have not minimized the automaton um, because we're interested in you know obviously the the minimal minimal automaton will be smaller than the automaton you get by the construction. Um, and uh, and we're interested in you know we're really interested in the minimal automaton, but of course if we have this construction, then it's easier to say something about what the construction gives us than what we'll get after we take the thing that the construction gives us and then minimize. Um, so all our all our bounds are going to be for this for this unminimized automaton, and that's an upper bound on the minimized automaton. And you can see that the terms the size is roughly double. Right, 83 to 194, 194 to 445. They roughly double at every step. You could kind of fit an exponential function here um, that's approximately you know 2.3 to the alpha. And so this is what you'd kind of this is what we what we hope for in terms of a bound. We want something you know that that is you know this 2.3. It's reminiscent of this two, right? So this 2.3 might generalize to something involving the prime that you're looking at. Um, so experiments suggest that we should be we should be looking for some kind of exponential bound for these things. Um, the bound that you get from the construction is doubly exponential, though. Um, so it's in terms of the the polynomial p that describes the the original algebraic series. Um, the height of a polynomial is the x degree, and the degree of the polynomial is the y degree. And the upper bound that you get from the construction is p to the p to the two alpha minus one, and then this you also have an alpha hd in the in the exponent here. Um, and this is this bound is huge, right? So for the Catalan numbers modulo two to the nine, this is the polynomial. The x degree is one, the y degree is two, and uh, instead of getting a bound of you know. Uh, what what it should what should it be? It should be about twenty four hundred. Um, we get a bound that's that's really really large. So why is the bound so large? Can we improve this bound? Can we get an exponential bound on the automaton size? Um, so a simpler setting than working modulo two to the alpha or p to the alpha is uh, that of finite fields. So uh, this work is split into two parts. One part is about finite fields, and that is on the archive. Um, I think that we put that on the archive in sometime in the fall, August or September, maybe. Um, and then the second part is going to be about integers modulo p to the alpha, and that is almost finished, but not finished yet. So let's talk about the finite field setting. Um, in the finite field setting, you have this really nice theorem by Crystal that says uh, that's a characterization of algebraic sequences over a finite field. And it says that a sequence of elements over a finite field is algebraic if and only if it is Q-automatic. So Q is some power of, of a prime here. So we have these two representations for such a sequence. We have a polynomial on the one hand representing the sequence in an algebraic way, and we have an automaton on the other hand representing the sequence in, a, in an automatic way. And, uh, and a natural question is, how do the sizes of these two representations relate to each other? Um, I think not much is known about starting with an automaton and getting a polynomial. So that would be an interesting thing to look at. But in the other direction, Variety proved this theorem in 2017 that if your minimal polynomial P has height H and degree D, then the minimal automaton has size basically Q to the HD where um, where you have some extra factor that, that goes to one um, as QH or D gets large. Uh, so a natural question is, is this bound sharp? You know, maybe there's still room for improvement. Uh, we think this bound is sharp. And so here are some um, experimental, uh, some results from experiments where we did searches over uh, all polynomials with a certain height and a certain degree. So the, here are the height and degree columns. Um, this is for the finite field F2 with two elements. And in this column, there is a there could be multiple polynomials that maximize the automaton size. Here we just picked one of them. So this is one example of a polynomial that maximizes the automaton size for that height and that degree. Uh, here is the automaton size that you get. And this is the main part and the main factor in Bridie's bound, the Q to the HD. Uh, you can see that 
the key to the HD is sometimes less than the automaton size. So this, this suggests that we, you know, that, that one plus little o of one term, uh, you really need that because it's Q to the HD is not, uh, is not an upper bound. It's just asymptotically the upper bound. Um, and, uh, and this last column, this is a, this is a, I don't know how to describe it. It's a, it's a, it's an actual bound. This is an actual upper bound, um, that we have. And, uh, unfortunately this, um, this column is greater than the automaton size. Um, but the, the point of this slide is that, that the automaton size seems to be pretty close to Q to the HD. Um, here's some data for Q equals three. Uh, there are a lot more polynomials here, so it, uh, it's a lot harder to get more, a lot of data here. But again, the automaton size is fairly close to Q to the HD. So this bound in the last column, um, well, okay, so can we get Bride? So Bride's proof uses tools from algebraic geometry and um, not being sort of living in the world of, of algebraic geometry, we wanted to know if you could get this bound without algebraic geometry. And so here is our theorem uh, that the minimal automaton size is at most Q to the HD. So this is the, this is the main asymptotic term. And then uh, you have this smaller term and we'll go, we'll go through this and to explain where it comes from and what it means. Um, these, these terms are very small. They're just, you know, log of H log of D. Um, so those are very small. Um, and this is the bound on the previous slide. So this is the, this is that third column. So this gives an exact upper bound for, uh, for the automaton size. And as a corollary, um, you know, asymptotically, these log terms are, are very small. Um, this L function we'll talk about, but you can show that this does give you a uh, Bridie's bound as a corollary. Um, all right, so we're going to, I'm not going to go through the proof. The proof is, is quite technical, but I want to sort of outline the proof in, in three steps. Um, so the goal is to get this Q to the HD bound. Uh, the first step is fairly simple. It's just to show that the number of states in the automaton is at most Q to the H plus one D uh, and then plus one. This plus one will come from the, the initial uh, state of the polynomial, the initial state of the automaton. Um, and then after that, we'll show that we're in a, in a nice space that has size Q to the H plus one D. So how does this work? So we have this expression from Furstenberg for uh, the, the power series F as the diagonal of a rational function. Um, it's going to be more convenient for us to shear this power series. So that instead of looking at a diagonal, we're looking at the coefficient of y to the zero. Uh, so we do that by, I mean, this, this Furstenberg's formula looks like there's a, there's a substitution for x, um, replacing x with x times y, both in this partial derivative in the numerator and in the, in the original polynomial p in the denominator. Um, so we just don't do that, or, or otherwise, otherwise you can think of replacing x with x, y inverse to undo this, this uh, substitution. So um, this is no longer a power series. This can be a Laurent series. Uh, so we have to be a little bit careful, but, um, but it turns out to be more convenient. And uh, we're going to let s0 be this numerator here. That's going to it's going to turn out to be the representation of the initial state of the automaton. And Q will be this denominator P over Y. Q will appear again and again um, for reasons that we'll, that we'll see on this slide. So how do we actually compute an automaton? Uh, we start with F as a, as a power series. And one way to do it would be to apply the Cartier operators to F. Uh, so what is the Cartier operator? The Cartier operator acts on a series uh, or a sequence by taking out an arithmetic progression of terms. So for example, if Q equals three, uh, this is the Cartier operator lambda one. We have a different Cartier operator for each base Q digit. Uh, and so this is going to pull out all terms that are congruent to one mod three in this case. So we get A1, A4, A7. Uh, and then if you're thinking about things in terms of power series, then we just sort of, um, we quotient the exponent by Q. So, uh, so this A1X becomes the constant term A1, the A4X to the four becomes A4X, et cetera. Uh, and so this is, this is 
probably the most complicated line of the talk, but it's probably the most important also. So we want to apply a Cartier operator to a power series. Um, the Cartier operators are going to map out the relationships between the states of the automaton because they're also mapping out the relationships of the uh, sequences of the Q kernel of the automatic sequence. Um, so we have this power series. It's the y to the zero term of some rational function. And we want to apply the rth Cartier operator to it. So this turns out to be the same as first applying a bivariate Cartier operator to this rational series. So this corresponds to lambda r zero. Uh, the r meaning in the x um, symbol, we're taking every r term, every um, we're taking every q terms starting with the rth entry. And in the y variable, the y exponents, we're taking every qth term, but starting with the zeroth um, index. So you can show that this is true. And then this is going from here to here. This is just multiplying the numerator and denominator by a power of q, so that we get q to the little q in the denominator. And the reason for that is because if you have q to the little q in the denominator and you're working over the finite field, with Q elements, uh, you can show that you can pull this out of the Cartier operator as long as you reduce the exponent by uh, by uh, by dividing by Q. So we get this Q in the denominator here. And the thing to point out is that we started with a bivariate series with denominator Q, and we ended with another bivariate series with denominator Q after applying this Cartier operator. And of course, we're extracting the y to the zero coefficient from both. Um, but if we're just interested, if we're interested in a finite representation of these series, then we have these nice uh, rational functions these, uh, that the, that the sequ series are diagonals of. And since they both have denominator Q, it's enough to work with the numerators instead of the denominators. So what we'll do is we'll represent all the states in the automaton by a polynomial. Uh, and if we start with a polynomial S and we apply the Cartier operator to the rational function that is described by S over Q, uh, the diagonal that's described by S over Q, then the new state we'll get is this uh, rational function. And so we'll define this little lambda, R comma zero, to be uh, big lambda r comma zero of s times q to the q minus one, because that's the numerator we have up here. So now we have finite representations of states of, in our automaton by polynomials in x and y. So these are still bivariate polynomials. Um, but, but this is the operation we're going to be interested in to go from one state to the other in order to build uh, our automaton. And so this is a proposition that gives us this first step. Uh, if you have a bivariate polynomial whose x degree is at most h and whose y degree is at most d, then when you apply the zero little lambda Cartier operator, uh, you get a state whose height, whose x degree is at most h. And if you apply any of the other Cartier operators, the height is even less. It's uh, less than or equal to h minus 1. And the y degree of the image of any S under any of the Cartier operators is at most d minus 1. So if we ignore this part, I mean, if this first bullet point is could be could be weakened to just say, well, the height, the x degree is always at most h. And the second bullet point says that the y degree is at most d minus 1. And so uh, the space of polynomials that we end up with has size h plus 1d, right? Height, uh, x degree at most h, y degree at most d minus 1. So this is where the h plus 1d comes from. The initial state, I remember, was, was this up here. Uh, since p, the initial polynomial p describing the series, has height h and degree d, uh, this polynomial also has height at most h and height at most degree uh, d. And so it's not in this smaller space. So that's why we have to add this plus one here for the initial state. But as soon, but it does satisfy the conditions of this proposition. So as soon as we apply any Cartier operator to the initial state, we're in uh, this smaller space that has Q to the H plus one D elements. 
So that's step one. Um, the ultimate goal is, of course, q to the hd, not h plus 1d. Uh, so this is step two. Uh, this is the goal, just to, to have this on the board for reference. Um, the next step is to get q to the hd plus something else. Um, so on the previous slide, we saw in that, let me back up a second. We're gonna, and here's where we're gonna use this. So when we apply any Cartier operator that's not the zero Cartier operator, we actually have a slightly smaller height and that's H minus one. And so let this vector space of polynomials W be the set of polynomials that has X degree at most H minus one and Y degree at most D minus one. So this has size Q to the HD. Um, by that previous proposition, we get into this space as long as we don't apply uh, the zero Cartier operator. And this proposition says that we stay in this space if we apply any Cartier operator. So every state that's outside of the orbit of the zero Cartier operator will be in W. So this is where we get this bound. This is the size of W plus anything we might be, um, anything that's, that's reachable from the initial state only by applications, repeated applications of the zeroth Cartier operator. Um, and I should say that this parallels Bridie's proof. So if it feels like you know we're not doing something that different from Bridie's proof, we're sort of doing, we're sort of translating um, algebraic geometry somehow into, into something that, that's really working with, with polynomials sort of more directly. Um, and then the final state will be to go from, the final step will be to go from this upper bound to this upper bound. So we already have the Q to the HD. Uh, what remains is to show that this, the, the orbit size under the zero Carti, Carti operator has a upper bound of this. So this is the last step. Um, these terms, well, we'll see where these terms come from. They're not, you know, again, they're very small. Uh, this L function is related to what's called the Landau function. Uh, so the Landau function, for example, if you were going to compute the Landau function of five, uh, what you do is you look at all integer partitions of five, so five, four plus one, three plus two, and you take the LCM of the parts in each partition, and you look at the maximum LCM that you get. So for example, this LCM is five, this, this LCM is four, this, this LCM is six, uh, and it turns out that the maximum LCM that appears when you take one of these LCMs uh, is six. So this is the Landau function. Um, we're gonna have three instances where we're gonna apply the Landau function. Um, and so where this comes from is, you know, why are we interested in the Landau function at all? What we'll end up with is we're going to see three univariate polynomials are their degrees are going to be H, D, and D, or at most H, D, and D. So that's where this H, D, D comes from. When we factor each of these polynomials, again, we're working in the finite field with Q elements, right? So we have unique factorization, unlike the rings case, which we'll get to later. Um, this factorization of a polynomial is going to give us a period length that is the LCM of the degrees. And, uh, and there may be some transient states before we end up in a, period, in a periodic orbit. And the transient length is gonna have to do with the exponents. So these log terms really come from the, the transient length. I'm simplifying a little bit here, but, uh, but these log terms come from the transients. Um, the, the Landau function is going to come up because, well, we want to know what we don't know what these polynomials are, are going to be. All we know is that their degrees are bounded by H, D, and D. So if we're going to get an orbit size or a period period length of that looks like this from this factorization, then we have to account for all possibilities. So what we're really looking for is uh, integer partitions of the degree of R. Um, because in the worst case, you know, maybe all these e's are one, and then the some of the degrees of the of these irreducible factors is the degree of r. And uh, and so this is this is where we'll get an LCM for a single r, and then we have to maximize over all the possibilities uh, for for that polynomial r. Uh, so here's the here's the slightly gory definition of this LHDD. We're gonna look at all 
integers between one and H, one and D, one and K. Look at all the integer partitions of those and then take the LCM of the LCMs of the integer partitions um, to get this Landau function, uh, this Landau like function. Okay. Um, so where do these three polynomials come from? So in this picture, this is, so let's go back two slides. Um, so W, remember, this is the space where we, once we're in W, we can't leave W. Uh, this is, this consists of all polynomials with X degree at most H minus one and Y degree at most D minus one. So where's that in this picture? Uh, X degree H minus one, it goes to here. So that's uh, this line, this vertical line. And uh, y degree d minus one is uh, um, this top row. So this is a slight, that was w, this is a slightly larger space that we call v. And it turns out that when you apply the Cartier operators, uh, we're interested in just the zero with Cartier operator. So this is the, this is lambda zero, zero. When you apply lambda zero zero to polynomials in this space, the the information uh, flows sort of towards the center. So here I've blocked up this basis into seven parts. Um, these seven parts are represented over here as um, as subspaces, and and the, the important thing is that when you apply this lambda zero zero Cartier operator, that's you know that's the, that's the last part to figure out what uh, you know what what the size of this orbit is. Uh, it, it turns out that if you just look at these left three vector spaces as a block, so that corresponds to looking at this left column. Um, in order to figure out what the what the output is of a polynomial when restricted to that left column. There's no arrows pointing into that left column. So all you need to know is what happened in the input in that column in order to figure out what's happening in the output in that column. And same thing for this top row. If you think of this top row as a block, there's no arrows pointing into that block. And so all the information about what's happening on that block is contained in the block. Um, before you apply the Cartier operator. And same thing with these rightmost, uh, with this rightmost column, there's no arrows pointing in there. So, uh, so basically there are univariate, you know, we can think of, we can project um, these, these left top and right borders to univariate polynomials. And we get a unit function on a univariate polynomials that emulates the bivariate lambda zero zero on these three borders. And this turns out to be enough to get the bounds we want. Um, what are, uh, so this is a univariate version of this lambda zero zero bivariate version. Um, before this was a Q for the bivariate version. Here it's this R. Where do we get these three univariate polynomials R? Uh, they come from P it turns out. So P was the original polynomial that describes the, the algebraic series. Uh, if you write p in two different ways, one you're looking at coefficients of x to the i as polynomials in uh, sorry, yeah polynomials in y, and also coefficients of y to the j as polynomials in x. Uh, the three polynomials are b d, so this represents the this is a polynomial in x that is the coefficient of the highest degree y to the d in p. Um, and A0 and AH, which are the coefficients, these are polynomials in Y that are the coefficients of X to the zero and X to the H. And these have degrees less than or equal to H, D, and D um, because of the degree bounds on P. Uh, and so this is this is this is where this is where the this, this Landau type function comes from because you you have a we have we don't you know we don't know what p looks like so we don't know what these polynomials r looks like, look like um, but the but in general the bound on these one one dimensional orbit sizes um, comes from this Landau like function uh, so let me just go back a, a second so where do we get the so this this is the size of um, let's see what is this 
Oh yeah. So then every so th these are this this tracks the orbits of the three um, borders, and then everything else is in this interior space here. So this we should get h minus one, d minus one. That's the size of this interior here. Once we've chopped off these three borders, uh, the size of this interior is uh, their their h minus one times d minus one. Um, monomials because the, the x degree is going from 1 to h minus 1 and the y degree is going from 0 to d minus 2. So that's where that second term comes from. How do we get this period length L that is the LCM of the degrees of the irreducible polynomials that factor that, uh, that are factors in 2? So uh, again, not going through proofs, but just could give you some idea about where this comes from. So now we're working in one variable because we've taken these border polynomials and we projected down to a, a single variable. So if this is a square free polynomial over FQ um, with some minor conditions, when we factor this into polynomials and let L be the LCM of the, of the degrees, then when, when we take this univariate operator lambda zero and apply it L times to any polynomial S whose degrees at most are, we get S back. So this is the period. So on one of these three border polyno uh, one of these three border spaces, um, the, the factorization of R will tell us um, what the maximal period length is. Uh, if it's not square free, you get some transients. And so that's where the, the, the transients come from. That's where those log terms come from. Um, why is this true? So here's where we're really using the fact that we're working over a finite field for the basically for the first time. Everything else that we've done up, up to this point, you could work would work over uh, over the ring of integers modulo of prime power. Um, but this is uh, this uses some results from field theory. So this says that the product of all monic irreducible polynomials with de degree dividing L, this is any L, not just not just this L is z to the q to the l minus z. Um, and the reason that this proposition is true is that this field, fq to the l, is the splitting field of this polynomial over fq. Uh, and so each element in this larger field has a minimal polynomial over q. And so if you multiply all those minimal polynomials together, uh, you'll get this polynomial. Uh, okay. So and so, so what we have is we have this minimal polynomial, this uh, this this uh, polynomial that is the product of all monic irreducible polynomials. Why are we interested in the product of all mon monic irreducible polynomials? Well, R is going to be some product of monic irreducible polynomials, except for some constant c, uh, and so R, uh, since we assumed that the that R of zero is non-zero, it's not divisible by Z. So in fact, it divides this polynomial, which is this polynomial divided by Z and then negated. Uh, so there's some polynomial T such that R to T equals this. And uh, then if we divide by, you know, we, uh, we can rewrite that as one over R is some, is this polynomial T over this. And if you expand this as a series, you'll see that this has period length uh, q to the l minus 1 at most. So the period length of this series, 1 over r, divides q to the l minus 1. And if you if you write, if you, you have to write everything as, as power series. Um, but this can be shown, this can be used to show that this orbit size under lambda 0 also has period length at most l. So this is kind of a transferring of the period length information about one over R to the period length information about uh, this lambda zero orbit size. Uh, so this is all very technical. Um, it's believe it, believe it or not, it's it's actually worse than it seems. Um, like I'm skipping some details, but uh, but the but the point is that over the over finite fields, we were able to get it. Um, this is where we were really using heavily the fact that we're working over a finite field. So the, the obvious question is, can we use the same approach to work modulo p to the alpha? So this will be in the second paper now. Um, we don't have 
splitting fields or anything. So we can't use theories, you know, theory about um, minimal poly multiplying minimal, minimal polynomials together. Um, but if you're looking at the power series one over R um, and you're expanding this, this is a, a, a rational function in a single variable. And so the coefficient sequence is, satisfies a linear recurrence with constant coefficients. And there are results about period lengths of, um, of constant recursive sequences, modulo primes and modulo powers of primes. Uh, so this is from a paper of Engstrom in 1931. Um, he, first, we're gonna work mod P still, and then we'll work mod P to the alpha. So mod P, uh, again, if we have a polynomial that's non-zero at zero, and we factor it into irreducibles, then one over R is periodic. Uh, this power series expansion is periodic with period length dividing this quantity where the E is the maximum of the exponents that arise in the factorization. And this L is the LCM of P to the degrees minus one. So it's reminiscent of the, of the field case, but we have to take this extra LCM. And modulo P to the alpha, um, if we know, so now take a polynomial with coefficients in the ring of integers modulo p to the alpha, um, some other minor uh, requirements that the coefficients of z to the zero and z to the r are non-zero mod p, so that they're invertible. Uh, then one over r, when you expand as a power series, it is periodic and uh, the period length divides this quantity where m is the period length of one over r mod p. So this is why we need this first theorem to talk about, um, to get the information about what's happening mod p, and then we can bootstrap it up to uh, mod p to the alpha. So this these pair of theorems are going to essentially replace the need to work over a finite field. Uh, and with this, we get an improved bound. So this is kind of just porting all of the finite field stuff into the ring of integers modulo p to the alpha. Um, the improved bound is p to the alpha n, where n is this quantity. And if you are paying attention, you will notice that this is still a doubly exponential bound. So, so this is not quite what we wanted, right? We wanted this exponential bound um, in terms of alpha. But here, alpha appears in the exponent of the exponent. So it looks like things are not good, but uh, there is... Uh, so can we get it a singly exponential bound? Um, but there is some actual, there's some structure in the states of the automaton uh, that we realized very late. Um, but it's it's actually really interesting. So so these you know these are the automata for the Catalan numbers modulo powers of two, uh, and these automata project to each other, right? So if you're looking at the Catalan numbers mod sixteen, all the information about the Catalan numbers mod eight is contained in the Catalan numbers mod 16, if we wanted to get this automaton from the mod 16 automaton, all you'd have to do is say, okay, well, let's take all the output states, all the output uh, values, uh, reduce the mod eight instead, and then minimize the automaton. So these are the minimal automata, but the idea is the same for the unminimal, for the unminimized automata, uh, right? So all these automata carry information about all of the lower automata, modulo smaller powers of two or smaller powers of p. Um, so since these automata all project to each other, you could you could take an inverse limit, and in the lim inverse limit, you would get some, you know a profinite automaton. Um, which is all well and good. Um, the question is, can we actually describe it? Can we say anything about the profine aut automaton? Can we see how these states project to each other algebraically by representing the states as polynomials? Uh, so here's an example of just a couple of the states in the unminimized automata for the Catalan numbers mod two and the Catalan numbers mod four. Um, for the Catalan numbers mod two, the initial state is y, uh, when you apply the zeroth Cartier operator, you get the state zero. When you apply the first Cartier operator, you get the state y plus one. Um, and here are the analogous states in the automaton for the Catalan numbers mod four. And you know what would be really nice is if you could just reduce these polynomials mod two and get these polynomials. Um, but that's not what happens. If you reduce this polynomial mod two, right? This term goes away, this term goes away. You'd get an x, y squared. Uh, you'd get a y 
but you'd also get an X, right? So we don't get this polynomial at all. And same thing with the other two. So how can we, you know, can we actually see that these that these polynomials do project to the other ones? So remember, there's a Q running around. This is the denominator of the rational function that describes uh, the Catalan numbers. Um, in this context, it's P over Y mod two, uh, which is this, pol this Laurent polynomial. In For the Catalan numbers mod four, it's P over Y mod four, which is this polynomial. And these two do project to each other because they just come from P over Y. Um, and so in a, an attempt to try to see where, you know, how to, how can we build up these mod four states from the mod two states, uh, we, we did reduce these mod two, and we don't get these two, these three states, but we did notice that when you reduce these mod two, they're divisible by Q. Uh, and so that's a big hint that there's some structure going on here. Uh, and when you write, you know, so so if these are divisible by Q mod two, you can say, well, what's the what's the remaining part? Like, let me, you know, let me take the multiple of Q that that is these things mod two and subtract it from these states, and then I get some, you know, some other part um, that will hopefully tell me how to lift the mod two states to the mod four states. Um, this is the representation you get. So mod two, this initial state is Y times Q. Uh, this state is zero times Q and this state is Y plus one times Q. So mod two, uh, you don't get these states, but you get these states times Q. And uh, and it turns out that when you keep going, if you look at the, the automata states for the Catalan numbers mod eight um, and you reduce them mod two, you get uh, something that's also divisible by Q. Um, it's not just divisible by Q, it's divisible by Q cubed, I think. Uh, and so this took some working out, but it turns out that there is a there's sort of a a p-adic representation for states in the automaton. Um, so the the nice thing is that if we're reducing mod two and then you know have something there and then lifting that mod four and then lifting that mod eight, then at every step we're only um, increasing. Basically, we're only dealing with base p digits. Uh, so let d be the set of base p digits. And the theorem is that every state in the automaton looks like this. So it's it's sort of hard to see how this relates to the previous slide, but imagine you have this big power of Q out here. You can imagine distributing that power of Q to every one of the terms on the inside. And then this uh, down here, you'll get T zero times this power of Q. Um, so instead of like a base P expansion, it's sort of a base P over Q expansion where P is P is a prime, but Q is this Laurent polynomial that describes the that comes from the the the, the rational function. So the, the theorem says that um, each state in the automaton is of this form. There's this power of Q, and you have this kind of P over Q expansion um, where each of these TIs is a Laurent polynomial with coefficients in mod p, not p to the alpha, even though this is the automaton that we're talking about is the automaton modulo p to the alpha, um, Laurent polynomial in x and y. Um, and uh, and this projection works. So if you take the automaton, uh, if you take a state in the automaton modulo p to the alpha and project it to a state in the automaton modulo p to the alpha one, alpha minus one, all you have to do is just get rid of this last term. So the projection is really nice. We have degree bounds for these T0, T1 polynomials that we're kind of thinking of as digits. So these are these are polynomials, but they're sort of digits in this base P over Q expansion. Um, and this fi finally does give us a singly exponential bound. Um, so it's P to the N, where N now involves alpha, uh, alpha cubed, but um, but it's not. There's no alpha in the exponent of the exponent. So I don't think we've, you know, I don't think we have any literature references to things that look like this. So if anybody has any, um, if anybody knows of any other place where things like this have come up, uh, we'd be really interested to know. Um, and then I'll just end by saying, you know, when we if we replace alpha equals one then we do get back to Bridie's bound. Uh, you can check when you plug in alpha equals one that this turns back into HD. So this is a, this is a generalization of Bridie's bound. Um, so so Bridie's bound is over the finite fields. 
Uh, we have a new proof of Bridie's bound for finite fields, and we were able to adapt that to the rings, uh, ring of integers modulo p to the alpha. Um, supposedly, there's no way to take algebraic geometry and 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 work modulo p to the alpha. Um, so so we've been told. So uh, so you really need um, a method like this in order if you're going to figure out what the if you're going to bound the sizes of automata modulo p to the alpha. All right, so I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Eric. Um, are there uh, are there any questions? Oh, Jeff's got a question. Just a quick question. I mean, uh, it, it's at least conceivable if you read in the other direction, you might get better bounds. Did you try to do any computations about that? Um, we we didn't uh the construction the construction for the automata um using the denif and lipschitz method is reading from the least significant digit first so yeah i guess we'd need another construction for yeah that. i was just proposing doing some actual calculations on oh, some just yeah see, i don't think just to see if there's any hope yeah yeah it's a great question i don't think we've done that yeah we should do that um are there any other questions I have a question. Yeah, Stefan. Uh, uh, Eric, you, you mentioned that you want to avoid algebraic geometry. So yeah. I wonder uh, I wonder why and what would uh, change if you don't want to avoid it? Um, well, personally, I want to avoid it because I, I'm not very comfortable with it and I don't know much about it. Um, but uh, but I think the, the real reason is that, you know, if, if we're interested in automata modulo prime powers. Um, suppose, I, I, Bridie, you know, I asked I asked Andrew Bridie, is there any hope of using his proof, you know, which works over finite fields in the context of integers modulo p to the alpha? And he, he said, no, there's no hope. Like the tools of algebraic geometry aren't, aren't built for that. So that's that's my understanding of the limitations. Um, but, but um, you know, I'd, I'd be up for, I'd be up to hear other other proposals. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, if not, um, thank you very much, Eric.